Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Christiane Ono, and I am the program coordinator for the Japan America Society of Hawaii. On behalf of Dash, I think I covered my camera. On behalf of Dash, I'm excited to welcome you to today's virtual workshop, Edible, Edible World Nature That Connects Us, co-hosted by the Japan America Society of Hawaii and the Akahiao Nature Institute. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, the Zoom meeting will be recorded and shared on our Dash YouTube channel. To minimize background noise, please keep your microphones muted unless it is your turn to share during the discussion portion of this workshop. Um, you may keep your cameras on throughout the program. In fact, we encourage it, um, especially when we're moving to the discussion portion of this workshop. As you can kind of tell by our chat already this morning, um, it'll be a laid back kind of informal vibe. So we highly encourage discussion and, and chatting. Um, and you are welcome to use the Zoom chat during the presentation to comment or ask questions. Um, so just a little bit of background about Jash and Akahiao. Um, Jash met the team at Akahiao through our Asian Pacific Children's Convention, or APCC, which is an annual international camp for 10 to 11 year olds in Fukuoka, Japan. Um, for 2021, due to the COVID pandemic, the APCC went virtual and its participants called our junior ambassadors were tasked with learning about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and enacting many projects to address these goals in their own communities here in Hawaii. Um, to prepare our four Hawaii junior ambassadors for this virtual international sustainability program, we visited the Akahiao Nature Institute's Huehue Ranch for a weekend in July to teach our delegation about sustainability and Hawaiian history and culture so they could share the unique perspective of Hawaii um, with other students in Japan and throughout the Pacific region. Uh, surrounded by the beautiful nature at Huehue, our junior ambassadors connected with the land, with each other, and with their own emotional well being in ways they couldn't back on Oahu. So now I'd like to introduce Akahiao's um, program team, which includes Julie Rogers, Jeff Fuchs, and Leanna McDonald Kainoa. Um, so Julie Rogers is the executive director of Akahiao. Her passion is to help humanity change the course of her story. Her current work is creating an immersive learning center to model the future, a future where humans have a symbiotic relationship with Mother Earth. Um, she has also served on the board of Hawaii Nature Center for nine years and crewed the Hokulea on her worldwide voyage. So welcome, Julie, and, and little Sebastian. <laughs> Um, Jeff Fuchs is a Kahio's resident explorer and program coordinator. He is a North Face ambassador and award-winning Canadian explorer who has led journeys along cultural highways and trade routes in Yunnan and the Himalayas, which National Geographic Traveler described as one of the top 50 journeys of a lifetime. Um, his recent documentary, The Tea Explorer, focuses on his life amidst the origins of all tea in the world, southwestern Yunnan province, and the ancient tea horse road. So welcome, Jeff. And then finally, we have Liana McDonald Kainoa, who is Akahiao's Community Outreach Coordinator and Cultural Liaison. She is a modern Kanaka Maoli from Hawaii Island who's deeply passionate about embracing Aloha Aina and the Hawaiian culture. She believes that everyone needs the opportunity connect, to connect with nature in a deep, visceral way. She sees the importance of environmental education and outreach and is committed to engaging with Keiki and the community to expand Aina-based learning. So we're very excited, Josh is very excited to partner with Julie, Jeff, and Liana in this virtual Edible World workshop. And without further ado, I will now turn the program over to the Akahiao team. Great. Well, I'm not going to go first, but I, I would love if Julie and baby Sebastian, if he's got any thoughts on this topic, or Liana, I would love it if you, if you kicked it off. Julie, would you like to start? I think Leanne. Hi, good morning. It's nice to see everybody here. I'm just here with uh, our newborn, seven month old. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Where would you like me to start? Um, with the director at Nakayao Nature's uh, Center Institute. I think I've seen, met most of you on the chat, so it's nice to see you all. Put a muzzle on it. He wants to say hi to everyone. 
Okay. I'll go next, Aloha. My name is Liana. Christian, thank you for the introduction. I wanted to start off by asking our audience and participants to um, write in the chat, chat box where you're tuning in from. Um, we are interested in where you are. And <clears throat> while you're doing that, I'll share a little bit more. I have been with Akahiao for a year now. This month um, marks a year. And it has been an amazing experience working at Hue Hue Ranch and really connecting with that Aina there. My background is in native forest restoration and conservation. That's my heart and my passion. And being with Akahiao and Jeff and Julie has really opened up and broadened my horizon um, in terms of learning about regenerative agriculture, permaculture, and food sustainability. That's something I've always been interested in. I believe that it's our future um, to be more sustainable as individuals and as communities. Um, and so I'm really, um, you know, eager to learn more about that and to continue passing that on to youth and sharing that with other people. And um, it's been amazing what we've been able to do, um, you know, with the groups that we've we've had this last year. We've been really fortunate to host um, groups, and it's been so essential for kids and students to to have a place where they can still play and learn and be outside with one another, um, and still have that social aspect. Um, good morning. Um, my two main functions are to sort of transfer a lot of what I've done in the past, what I've learned in the past from the exploration world. So sort of to transfer, how can we engage youth and have them participate, have them feel as though they're being acknowledged and to have them engaging in something visceral and tangible, not just theoretical. So I think one of, one of the things I feel very strongly about, obviously, is the tea time, because I think it's an informal time for a lot of the students come into the, the program uncertain of what their role is going to be, perhaps uncertain that they're going to be engaged. Is this just another program? So the tea time for me is one of the first little, I don't know, informal offerings, tools that, that I like to, to engage with to just open up the conversations from the very beginning of a program, to get a conversation between youth, ourselves, the land. Um, I, I feel that tea does that, um, partially from over a decade living in, in Asia. I've been sort of, I, I suppose, spoiled and in, influenced by that. And the second thing I, I think is really, really, really vital for, for kids and for adults is that within nature, if there's an informal willingness, I think some of the great conversations, some of the great solutions, some of the great uh, restorative moments take place outside of walls. Um, right now we're in a, we're doing this virtually. So much of the world right now is being conducted virtually. And I think more and more, even more now, there will be a great need to have youth engaged outside of walls, uh, not, not excluding the virtual world, but including more of an engagement with the outdoors. So my role as the director of outdoor programming is simply to, to ensure that there's enough of that time where we're not simply telling the participants what to do, how to think, not at all. More like providing them with an ambient uh, space to feel safe and to encourage them not just to learn things, but to have conversations with each other to interface. So anyways, and welcome to you brave people for, for engaging on a Saturday morning with us. And uh, we're very appreciative that you showed up. Um, so to touch on a little bit more <clears throat> of the programs that Akahiao offers, 
um, you know, one of the main components is food, which um, is our direct connection with nature, of nature. Um, so there's no little no eyal that I would like to share, and it's holo ia kapapa kau ia e kamanu, which means when the shoals are full of fish, birds gather over them, meaning that where there is food, people gather. That's Olala no Eyal number 1052 by Mary Kavana Pukui. And that couldn't be more true. Um, you know, where there is food, people gather. And that's a foundational element um, globally and especially at Akahiao. Um, we all know this to be true. If you need to lure someone somewhere, just offer them food. Um, and <clears throat> not only do we believe in um, connecting with food, but also being really informed about where your food is coming from, how it's being grown, what practices are being used. Uh, so the mala or the garden is our focal point of Hue Hue Ranch. That's where we spend uh, a lot of our time. <clears throat> and as you'll see in the virtual tour, in the video coming up, uh, Aina speaks for itself. Um, we'll introduce some of the plants and edibles that are there. But before that, I wanted to touch on the theme, which is nature that connects us. Um, I have, <clears throat> I, I want to talk about our ancestors' view of nature um, because I thought about this for a little bit. And nature that connects us almost entails that nature is separate from ourselves when really we are a part of nature and indigenous cultures have perceived it. Um, in that way, people in place are never to be removed from one another, that they're one whole component, they're holistic. Um, and the land are the people, the people are the land. And so much so that in Hawaiian language, there is no direct translation for the word nature. And indigenous cultures were so intricately linked to the natural world that their relationship was a reciprocal one, and it was one of aloha. Every Thing in their eyes, all life was sacred. And because it was sacred and viewed that way, the natural world was one of kinship. And that resulted in this intimate relationship where they came up with hundreds and thousands of names for winds and rains and all the elements um, that surrounded them in their environment, including the plants and the animals. They could identify hundreds and thousands of them. And they knew exactly what they were used for. Given that they relied heavily on their natural resources to survive, it provided everything that they needed for food, shelter, clothing, medicine, implements, and so much more. And because of that, they inherently saw the value in it. And I feel that today we've lost a lot of that pilina or that relationship and connection um, because so much is provided for us at the store um, or in other ways that we really at times don't know where our food comes from. We don't even know what the tree looks like or we're disconnected from it. And culture you know, has shaped our landscapes and seascapes forever. And so that's where you know, we're at today. And that's kind of um, what we encourage the youth in our programs to do is to find their own connection and you know, with nature. Um, as it strengthens our sense of self um, and it, it makes us better people. Uh, nature is our greatest teacher. Um, and uh, I also feel that Indigenous thinking has influenced uh, a lot of Akahiyal's values, concepts, and ideas um, from agricultural practices, reverence for nature, and the sacredness of connectedness to life. And um, that's something that I know I personally. Um, have felt throughout my entire life, and I hope to share that or um, pass that on to at least you know some some of the kids that will receive that. Just just one thing to add as a, as a sort of a as an intro into what we do at Akahia. One of the first things we do when the bags are put down, when the tea, first cup of tea, which is very necessary. Um, when the first cup of tea is had, we simply go on an orientation walk through the property. And the purpose of that orientation isn't necessarily simply to 
tell the youth, this is where you do this, this is where this is. In fact, a lot of the orientation is to informally get a lot of the program participants just talking to each other. And what we found is a lot of the participants, be they young students, be they elders, will actually feel more comfortable introducing parts of who they are through this walk through nature, as well as pointing out to us often in cases what they recognize. They're often recognizing a certain herb or plant or tree or a certain fauna that grows. So that this orientation, which can go anywhere from 30 minutes to almost two hours, we sort of just, the idea is that we take a walk together and start having conversations. And it, has, it sounds like an informal, very unstructured way to begin what can be a, a fairly intense program, but we found that starting off each program, starting off each day with this walk through nature um, is, is an incredible way to get people just communicating with one another. The phones are off and we have no problem keeping the phones off. It's amazing. So many people, I've heard them say, oh, the youth need to be online. Well, in fact, I don't, based on what we've seen, I don't believe they do need to be online uh, nonstop. I think it's up to us as mentors, teachers, friends, stewards to, to engage youth. And I think when they're engaged in that, in that way, outside of walls, um, there, there's a tremendous restorative aspect to it. So just tying in with what Leanna mentioned about, I guess our philosophy and her philosophy and the island uh, philosophy, I think it's really important to just put in that little segment about how we do orientation at the beginning of every program right now, by the way. It's allowing the participants sort of this safe environment to just A little bit more, just one little thought about nature connecting us. There are a lot of catchphrases and cliches and uh, mantras that were not us personally, but that are being used uh, in relation to nature and the connectivity. I'll only say this about what we've seen at Akahiao. There is no greater gift than to see this connection taking place in real time. Um, a lot of a lot of kids from urban environments have been to our our property, and it's not just our property. They've never really been to uh, an environment where they have to erect their own tent, where they have to pick, harvest uh, their own food. But when you give them the tools or the the space, the scenario to do that, um, time and again, we've seen that youth will be with you on that journey. They're happy to do it, even if it's something foreign at the beginning. So I think one of the, the keys for any organization, any nonprofit, any, any steward, any conversation is to simply, to do it as quickly and as informally as possible to allow and empower the, the, the kids, the, the participants to start doing it immediately not talk too much about it, not laden them with too much information, but just to give them some tools to start engaging immediately. And then they, are, they become stewards. Um, Christina, maybe we can go ahead and play the video because <clears throat> it is 25 minutes long, I believe. Ua lu kini kini ka hua o hi a le hua mai o a o lono nui a ke a hali hali ia e ke e heu hulu makani 
i poi ia e ka poli mahana o ka nehoa o honua mea. Ua a, ua mole, ua mohala ela, o ka apapane, o ka mamo, o ka nuku i iwi, o ka ahihi, mai hiki lalo a i hiki luna e waihone i hali i mokuna. Ua i kea, he leo noia. Mahalo. Aloha kako e komo mai welcome to Hue Hue Ranch. I am Liana McDonald Kainoa and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for Akahia Nature Institute. And I am Jeff the Director of Outdoor Programming here at Akakiao, right here. So to tell you a little bit more about this place, this Vahipana, we are at Hue Hue Ranch, which was historically one of the more well-known and famous ranches here on Hawaii Island. We're located on the slopes of Hualalai, and if we go back in time a little bit, this was established in 1886 and at one time it was over 40,000 acres and it encompassed many ahupua'a from Mauka to Makai. Um, we are located near Kaulana, Ahupua'a, Hukio, Mahaiula, Makalavena, as well as Ka'upulehu. Um, so today it is privately owned and we're sitting on about 160 acres. What we're going to show you and give you a little bit of a tour of um, is kind of a, a transformation from ranch land, degraded ranch land, um, to something that has been bioremediated into regenerative farming. And so here at Akahiao, we host outdoor nature programs for youth, and some of the activities that we focus on include really developing your Kinina, your relationship with nature, as well as tapping into some of these ancestral skills that we tend to lose sight of. So one of those activities include um, out planting, getting your hands dirty, um, learning about permaculture and how to utilize the resources available to you, including invasive plants and weeds to build soil, feed the soil nutrients, and then to grow edible plants so that it sustains us. Um, one of the other activities that we do consists of building infrastructure. So we look for branches and other materials that we can find and we let kids build things. And surprisingly, they are excellent at coming up with teepee huts and, and things that can actually be used. Um, so yeah. Uh, one of my personal favorite activities is, of course, tea time. Uh, not only is it a personal addiction, it is um, also a time to take, to make an offering to others, to prepare the tea. It's also a time to re-engage with the question of values as you're being offered something. And we're asking so much of youth these days to, to feel, to change the way, the course, the direction in which our planet's going. Uh, we're asking them to participate in nature more, and yet we seldom offer the opportunity for them to get into nature. So this is part of our playground, part of our workshop, part of our outdoor classroom, if you will. And one of my favorite activities is not only just engaging and being outdoors, but it is that wonderful offering of tea which permeates every program, every day, every group size, every age group that we, uh, we encourage to, to join us here. So the tea time is nothing more really than encouraging an understanding of the importance of time and interacting with each other and this grand space. 
And one more thing. So we always emphasize Kilo for observation. So while we take you on this virtual tour today, we'd like you to make observations of what you see and type that into the chat box so that we can engage with one another and perhaps you'll see something that we missed. And if you do see something that we missed that we don't know, we'll find out for you. A lot of what we're trying to do here with the Kahiao Nature Institute with our programming is to viscerally and tangibly demonstrate this whole value system that we're, we're encouraging, interconnectivity. And it's hard to do that theoretically if we don't actually practice it or have a playground, a workshop, or this, our classroom. So we feel that this is one of our classrooms. Um, so we've got everything here. Some things don't work, some things mix and interact with others well, some things don't. For instance, Moringa. Superfruit turned into a bit of a trendy item right now. Grows next to tomatillos or tree tomatoes, which if you haven't made a pasta sauce with this, you're missing something. Um, further up here, we have chayote, otherwise known as shushu in South America. A lot of these things aren't simply growing on Big Island, but they're growing in South America, Central America parts of Southeast Asia. So this is one of the other favorites I have. We simply take the shoots, you can eat them raw, we can put them in a stew loaded with all kinds of great stuff. Mm -hmm. And it also, there's the fruit. And in Brazil they use the chuchu, the, the actual fruit. It's this very hard, waxy shape. They use that as a potato, a very simple carb. And this takes over like a river if it's allowed to. And for those of you who thought we wouldn't introduce any citrus, we have citrus. Mm -hmm. Lime, lemon, which we have grown from the ground up. It should be mentioned that everything you see around us right now was started about five or six years ago from the soil, literally from the ground zero of the soil and built up. First to build the soil, then to activate and encourage and restore the acidity, the pH, the trace mineral count of the soil. And then from that point, we could start to experiment, we could start to encourage, and we could start to create this little example of how things might be. Wow, that's really good. So I can smell citronella in the air right now. We passed a bunch of that. Sorry. A really great natural bug repellent if you get a chance to harvest some. You can make it at home without all the harsh chemicals. I wanted to point out we have kabocha squash currently um, ready to be harvested. We call them dinosaur eggs. <laughs> they kind of look like that. They're hidden under the leaves. Um, and I'm gonna take you over to our special and juicy dragon fruit. So you can see here we have the dragon fruit. There's a couple that are coming through right now. And it looks like maybe there were a few more, but the bugs may have kind of gotten to those a little bit. But essentially, they're growing on the on branches and logs that were found here in the garden. 
that created this trellis effect. So of course there's things we encourage to grow. We deliberately propagate, we seed, we graft, but then there's things that come as a result of our efforts, gifts as we call them. So along this log, which was felled and left here, turkey tail, a hugely medicinal fungus has exploded. And so that at one point in the future, perhaps, when we decide to do our own infusions or pulverize some of these funguses into medicinals, we'll be able to harvest not only the essential foodstuffs, but also the medicinals which are growing all around us. So earlier this year in the spring, we hosted a Khufu service project and a group of about 20 Kupu members built and gilded these two food forest plots. And as you can see, we are really promoting biodiversity. Um, I'll point out a few here. So we have a lot of pollinator plants and um, that are attracting bees and other pollinators to this area. We have a citrus tree, um, we have olenna, or turmeric, tulsi, basil, holy basil, and we also have cassava, to name a few. And the idea here was to establish a food forest with different layers and strata. And so we have trees that will eventually grow in and be more of your long-term plants. We have a mid-story such as the cassava, the other shrubs, and then kind of buried beneath we have ground covers, um, annuals and perennials that will come and go in cycles. And the idea here is that they coexist with one another. Um, we're practicing regenerative agriculture while using some permaculture techniques. And so we prepped the sites and a few inches below what you see uh, is a very, very rocky lava substrate. Um, so using and utilizing a lot of the plants that are already here, um, we've rebuilt the soil and we've also taken small sticks and branches and layered that down. We've mulched it to add um, more nutrients to the soil to give it more girth for everything to grow. Um, so we have more cassava here. We do have a native tree. Uh, this is Colomona. It's in the legume family. And these tiny little flowers actually give off a light fragrance. One of my favorite understated elements of our garden is oregano. We know it, of course, from the, the much storied Italian cuisine, but in our garden here, it operates on a different level. This is a protector. Not only does it help the soil replenish itself, but this is also a sort of barrier against pests. This releases a kind of microtoxin that bugs do not like, along with geranium. So not only does it taste good in a little pasta sauce, but hello, it's a guardian of the garden. All right, so in this part of the mala, I'm going to introduce you to a handful of trees that have been well established. So over this way, we have the loquat tree. Uh, which fruited earlier this year, so you probably won't see anything on the tree at the moment. Um, but it fruits these little orangish um, sweet fruit um, that have a very soft, delicate skin. And we have our, our infamous guava. We love to make guava juice with. 
going off right now. Um, a tree that we have a little bit lower by the house is fruiting and they're super ripe right now. This one is still in the process. And then of course, the jacaranda tree, um, which are scattered throughout the property. And you'll see a ton of these tr trees throughout North Kona. I can see some bird's nests from here. There's one right up there. Um, So this is the Malabar or the Brazilian chestnut. You can see that it's fruiting and it's still in the process of maturing. And we also have the Acerola cherry. And behind that, we have a soursop to the left, and we'll make our way around the corner. Papayas, and it's flowering stage. And in case you didn't know, if you see papayas hanging like this one is, that means it's a male plant. Hmm. Hmm. All right. So next we're going to take a look at the mamaki plant. You might be familiar with this plant. It's well known as being used for tea. Uh, it is endemic to Hawaii, so it's found nowhere else. It's in the nettle family. And if you know about nettles, you know that they're packed with antioxidants. And ancient Hawaiians used mamaki during ceremony and for healing purposes. It also has a very special relationship with two native butterflies, the pulelehua, the kamehameha butterfly, and the blackburn butterfly, both of which are endangered. So it's very important that we have mamaki persisting in our landscape. And it's another reason you don't want to spray it with any herbicides. A lot of times, the caterpillar will roll itself up in a dried leaf, so it's hard to even tell that it's there. But rest assured that they might be there, they might be present, um, so you want to leave it alone as much as possible. And some of the healing benefits of the mamaki, a lot of people drink it to induce feelings of calmness, and it's packed with anti antioxidants, like I said, um, that helps stimulate brain activity. It lowers high blood pressure. And in ancient days, they used it um, with women who were giving birth. So because of that calming effect, it helps our muscles. Um, so it is a very special plant, and it's one that we're really thankful to have an abundance. You can still find it naturally occurring in many places. If you do want to propagate it, the best way to do that is to scatter the seeds. So you can facilitate that by finding the little fruits here like that. And when you squish it, you'll see here there's tons of little seeds inside and what you want to do is push those through a strainer and what I learned is if the seed sinks it's good to grow mm. but if it floats you don't want to use those. One other thing that I learned from a kuhuna la'au lapa'au is that you only want to drink the mamaki while it's hot um, because it's so powerful the recommend using it for healing purposes and not recreationally as a daily beverage. Okay, cool. So this place is an interactive experience and I think it's consistent with our values, the way we promote this sense of 
interaction between plants, between us and the natural world. And this is part of this kind of random design of permaculture that has benefited us and all of the people, the youth, the groups that we've had that have come through. It's not always a cubicles of beautiful color in squares. This is more of a sort of a lush, sort of jungle-esque kind of environment. We have fennel, one of my favorites. Um, another thing we do, and this is not so much about the actual interior and the, the, the opulent colors, this is more about everything that falls here generally, if it's not eaten by us or all of those wonderful critters, it just lies where it is and it forms a mulch. That's a big part of how we propagate the health of the soil. One of my personal favorites, one of the only ones I consistently go for, uh, edible hibiscus tree spinach, otherwise known as belay. You can read it, eat it right off of the stems. Where I'm taking you is to one of the, for me at least, the center points of the garden for very selfish reasons. The tea plant. We're going towards the tea plant. But on our way, of course, some of you might be familiar, in the south of France, in Luberon and Provence, this grows in abundance. Huge fields of it, lavender. It grows here, in amidst all of this other wondrous green stuff. It's our little duck enclosure. And it should be noted, a lot of the structures here, a lot of the gardening, a lot of the growth has been promoted, started, engaged in and done by students. So there's a living legacy of each group that comes through here leaves a bit of themselves, a bit of their work in the form of a living forest. Here we have our local duck population, otherwise known as the Wacker family. So in June of 2016, I had some tea seeds. I drink tea. Tea is part of what we do here at Akahiao Nature Institute. Um, and I decided I wanted to see if we could actually grow some of the tea ourselves um, using the same permaculture biodynamic systems that are in place here. We decided to try and build the soil so that it was capable of actually growing tea from seed. And as a dedicated tea junkie, it was important that I keep the source of my addiction close. And so this is the result of five years of growth. Camellia sinensis, sinensis, the bigger family of tea, is something that is vital in my life from over a decade of living in Asia. And it's something I wanted to incorporate in every course that we run, every program we run here, as an offering to students. In every course we run, I make an offering of tea because I think it's a beautiful way to start off the the process by giving something. It's part of that wonderful dynamic way of making an offering. It's also the great restorer, stimulator. So we grow tea here as part of the, the bigger landscape. We offer tea and tea has become, our tea offerings have become one of the highlights of our programs. Uh, we have kids who've sworn off tea, coffee, they're not interested, tea is kind of uh, old fogey. No, nope, they love it. They love it. And our tea times are based upon the value of simply encouraging interaction. So the tea isn't a formal tea offering. It's, it's kept as informal as I, as I can manage. And it is about taking tea and taking time to encourage an interactive feel with nature, with oneself or with others.
So I realized that a lot of themes were probably repeated, not only from our introduction, but in the video, but I hopefully it sort of gives you an, an overview of, of what we're doing. Of course, the best thing is just to simply come and see the, come and see the, the program or interact in the program itself. Um, but a couple of things just to, that weren't in the video that I think it's sort of, it's sort of a truth of most experiential learning or experiences is that just simply being amidst an environment is in itself, um, not only learning about the environment, but it's also learning about the, the precious relationship of how we interact um, in that environment. And as much as it is about the plants, is is about the sort of the cultural aspects of the property of the big island of this of this of this state. I think one of the biggest sort of things we see and, and try to encourage is just to, to have youth feel like they're seeing themselves in perhaps a new light and being able to tap into these sorts of things, these sorts of feelings and expressions to see themselves as being a participant in the natural world, regardless of their knowledge base, whether or not they know anything about botany or plants, it, that's not the important aspect. It's almost to provide a sort of sanctuary where people and particularly youth can just be themselves and be a new version of self. Um, so yes, uh, I realize we're, we're winding down time and I'm supposed to do a live tea session. I will tell you, it's all here. Um, one thing to mention about tea, and I, I saw in the chat that David ran a tea shop, which is fascinating. Even more fascinating is that you no longer do caffeine. Um, we could do another chat about that sometime. But I think one of the, the important aspects of tea for me is, is the quality of the tea is important. Uh, for certain, but the, the idea of an offering, uh, the idea that we prepare the tea for the groups and we don't lead the conversation. So the tea time is often 10, 15, 20 minutes of just the group participants interacting amongst themselves. And what we found is that if we forget to do a tea time, which has happened. We're running other things. We're picking, we're making pizzas. We're picking fruit, vegetables. We actually have youth who remind us that, wait a minute, don't, haven't we forgotten tea time? And it isn't necessarily that they love the tea, although I'd love to think so. It's they really enjoy the moments where that free bit of 15, 20 minute tea time uh, the, the time for open and free communication conversations amongst themselves, often about something related to something they've done together. Those moments become precious to, to a lot of the participants and uh, particularly the youth, I think. Just, just for the tea, uh, the tea obsessed amongst you. Um, one of the things I do talk about when I do the tea times with the kids is I introduce the pots, I introduce the leaves, I try to introduce the growers, many of whom were are good friends of mine. And over the course of this summer, there have been at least five people, maybe, maybe a half dozen, who have communicated with me after the fact that they're now incorporating a kind of tea time into their life at university or at home. Um, they don't discuss the quality of the leaves, but they do, they do try to introduce the idea of a tea time at home, I think, to sort of democratize the conversations so that everyone gets their piece of time to discuss. And that's a big thing during the tea time is that every participant participates, contributes, um, and has their time to discuss and shine a bit. Does anyone have any questions for us or if we can dive in a little bit deeper um, on some of the topics that we um, shared in the video, you're more than welcome to.
or even just comments. <laughs> it could be about tea, it doesn't have to be. I'm going to go ahead and throw Regan under the bus because I see that he's part of this call and Regan was one of our junior ambassadors Regan. that I mentioned Regan? in our um, in the introduction. Um, Regan, are you are you there? And if you are there, could you please share um, your favorite memory about your time at Hue Hue um, with Liana and Jeff and Julie? I'm counting on you, Regan. No, <laughs> no pressure. You can type it into the chat. Uh, my favorite part about the um, the trip was the the food, and that you guys used the stuff from your garden. It was like it was very good. I especially like the um the pesto pasta. Uh, tried many times to recreate the pesto. I never got it to the right point. Just just so you know, Regan. None of us give out the correct recipe for that pesto pasta because we don't want it being replicated. It's deliberate on our part. It's like the hidden, it's the hidden secret of, uh, no, that's not true. That's not true. Thank you for sharing, Regan. I didn't even realize you were on the call. It's good to, uh, it's good to hear you again. Is there anybody else on this call from the, who else was there? No. Well, Regan was one of those who grew uh, during the trip. I mean, I'd like to think everybody grows, but sometimes you don't see it um, in the, especially a brief program, but Regan was like unleashing by the end of the, uh, by the time it was time to go back to Oahu, Regan was involved in everything we were doing. And I'm delighted, so Regan, much. because I wouldn't have guessed that you would have talked about the food. I think it's amazing that you brought the food aspect up, Regan. Impressive. Sorry, Leanna? I was also gonna mention that Regan was uh, amazing at Kilo and observation. I think the whole group was, and probably one of the more observant groups we've had and they could point out you know everything from the smallest little um mushroom growing to you know just everything so we really appreciate that as well when we you know see kids um, engaging in that way well and i think I we they could, could all be like that i think regan was somebody i learned from because when you went through the forest regan you were pointing out minute details about the living canopies of the forest that I may not, I may have pretended I knew, but I was looking at you going, oh, you have to watch this Regan character. Impressive. And yet it's the pesto that you talk about. Oh. Anything else, Regan? I'm always interested in your thoughts. You can share notes after this chat is done if you want. Um, no, I don't have anything else to share, but it was like a really fun experience for me. Reagan, there you are. Great to see you. Glad you're on the call because it often feels like when we have programs where we have these intense get togethers and then all of a sudden people leave and we're heartbroken and ugh, it's just, it's really depressing really. So it's good to see you again. And I hope you're back at some point because you particularly, you know so much about the plant matter, you'd see loads of change. Evolution, things are gone. We had a pig infestation, by the way, Regan, since you were there last. And I think, well, I'm not sure we had is the correct term. We have a pig infestation going through the gardens and the forests. And, and we actually spoke to a young, someone about your age, about, um, how to deal with the pig situation because fences are no longer, I guess, doing the trick. We've got pigs coming in from unknown parts of the forest and coming in and 
basically having a smorgasbord overnight in the garden. So we're actually interested in any thoughts on prevention, any plants that they may not like. Um, you know, we're always interested in natural sort of defense mechanisms uh, because I think you, you know that the pigs here, at least on Big Island and Oahu are doing a lot of damage. Um, so um, we have family that lives up um, on the Big Island and we're, we're thinking about buying land up there too. So does that mean you'll be available for free free consultations at a Kahiao? Hopefully. <laughs> oh, it'd be great. It'd be great to see you on Big Island again. Okay, take care, David. Sorry, I'm just saying. Yes. Yeah, I, I think. I think we're going to need to uh, engage your age group with solutions for for things like pigs, um, things like alternatives to pesticides, things like this. Because I know in certain families on throughout the islands there are these old methods, very simple, straightforward methods to not only deal with the pigs but deal with lack of water, lack of rainfall. Um, and people like you, Regan, specifically people like you, I don't, I don't say generally, because you've got a real, I think, aptitude and a real knowledge bank of yeah, just mindsets towards the land, how to treat the land. You have a tremendous amount of knowledge. Um, so I, like with this young, this young man we just spoke to on Big Island, I think people like you are going to be initiating a lot of solutions in, in how we move forward with uh, restoration, um, protecting natives, uh, native crops here, and also dealing with those wonderfully intelligent pigs, which seem to defy fence lines. So Suzanne has asked, um, drinking today, Jeff? No, I'm drinking what I normally drink, um, a shampoo, a raw puer from an area called Pasha in southwestern Yunnan. Thank you for the question. Always love when it's tea related. It's about of the, the morning here in Hawaii. Any other comments or questions? And you're allowed to disagree with things too, by the way. I think there's another question from uh, Lila about what kind of tea do you recommend? Ooh. Well, certainly not decaffeinated. I don't think David's with us, so I'm not gonna be offending him by saying that. Um, I, have, I have preferences, but I, I think non-blended teas, so teas that are single origin. Japanese green teas are brilliant. Uh, raw puwares are great. I think a lot depends too on when you drink them. Um, some people will say that tea, certain teas, including Japanese green senchas, for some they're a bit hard on the stomach without food. So I think sometimes, for me, I like these, the stimulant component. I love puer, I love sencha, a nice oolong. Um, some people will say too, it's not good to hit the system first thing in the morning without any food in the system with tea, just because the acidic aspect, I defy that. <laughs> to, me, to me, there's nothing better than, than, than getting tea into an empty system first thing in the morning. But the mamaki is also beautiful. And that's, I think Auntie Liana had mentioned that it's part of the nettle family. So there's a lot of um, really medicinal benefits to it, lowering blood pressure. It's got calcium, chromium, magnesium. So a lot of the, the nettle um, micro elements, trace minerals are absorbed at night. So a lot of the old paniolos here on the big island will say, 
Um, one of the famous ones, uh, uh, Uncle Mekikato used to say, um, Koko Olao and also Mamaki tea at night helps to restore and heal the body after long days, whatever they were doing. So um, as much as we need a stimulant during the day, I think it's really nice to finish off with something that relaxes at night. So the mamaki, and we have mamaki growing everywhere. And in fact, with a lot of the, the, the programs, we encourage the kids to, uh, to pick on their own. We dry it and they desiccate it and they take it home with them. And it's easy to prepare. 15 minutes in a slow boil is, even with the raw leaves, 15 minutes slow, slow easy boil, and then it's, then it's ready. tea question Jeff hmm. so when it comes to quality of tea do we need to be careful or uh, look into where it's grown or how it was grown because we talk about you know fruits and vegetables being sprayed and having like residual herbicides or pesticides left on it is that something that um, you consider when you are looking into teas or is it better to buy organic tea or what do you think? I, I think the source or trusting a good vendor, whoever, whatever the trust means these days, because it's a, but trusting a vendor and trusting the source is really important. The organic certification is something in certain countries that doesn't mean anything because they'll test for 30, 30 items. Um, in other countries, organic tests for over 200. So whatever organic means these days, I think just trying to keep things local is, is as important yeah. as anything. And I noticed Regan, and I'm always, always happy to hear and read from Regan, um, a wild pigs going into their property. Yeah. You know, it's too bad there isn't a tea which we could uh, start feeding the wild pigs to give them some indigestion, or that might actually make them eat more. Check this out, Regan. Yeah, Heloside as well, Regan has a lot of problems because they have such, such good rainfall. I think it's like, a, it's like a smorgasbord of salad out there for them. But yes, Leanne, I think tea, know your source. That's certainly one of the mantras in food right now. Um, certainly, I think anyone with common sense uh, will, will, will say the same thing. Eat as local and as seasonal as you can. Eating things out of season is one of, I think, one of the, not ills of the world, but eating out of season is one of the reasons why we have so many uh, transportation issues. Um, a lot of people have never actually had a tomato that tastes like a tomato in season. Um, so yeah, I, th I think tea falls into the same category. Okay, so it's 11 past 11 now. Um, so I'm going to ask Liana and Jeff, unless there's anything else you'd like to share with our attendees today, um, if we could maybe wrap up for today. Um, but we do have part two of this workshop. So we can definitely revisit any of these topics um, during the next one on Saturday, November 13th. Um, so the um, link to register for the next workshop has been posted in the chat box. And I'll also send um, all of our attendees today um, a link to the recording of this video of today's workshop, as well as a link to the video you all watched of the virtual tour, um, and also a link to register for the November 13th workshop. Um, so thank you so much, um, Jeff, Julie, and Liana, the team from Akahiao, for this great program and for introducing us to your wonderful Mala. Um, and to everyone who attended today, have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much. Take care, Reagan. Mahalo.